Well, this morning, I'd like for you to turn in your Bible with me, if you would, please, to the book of Isaiah, the greatest of the Hebrew prophets, Isaiah. And I'm going to read beginning in chapter 6 and verse 1. So I hope you brought your Bible. I didn't tell you previously uh, that you could go and fetch it there, but if you will, go pick up your Bible if you don't have it. Isaiah chapter number 6, and I'm reading beginning in the first verse. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. And then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth. And he said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. And I, heard, and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then said I, Here am I, send me. This is undoubtedly one of the greatest chapters in all the Bible. It's recognized as being that by many Bible scholars. And so there's some golden chapters that occur throughout the Scripture. I think of Genesis 1, the story of creation. I think of John 3, the, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son verse. I think of Romans 8, and the work of God in the life of the Christian for good. I think of 1 Corinthians 15, and I think of 1 John chapter 5, and oh, it just goes on and on, these wonderful golden chapters. Well, there's two or three of those chapters that we're going to find here in the book of Isaiah, and chapter 6 is certainly one of them. And so the message this morning is, when Isaiah met God, what happens to a man when he truly, genuinely meets God himself. That's what this passage is about. An event so memorable that Isaiah never got over it, and he refers to it numerous times throughout his book here. Now, this is what we call a space-time event. And let me describe that phrase to you, if you will. A space-time event is a way of saying that this was a real event that occurred on a specific day and in a specific place, space. This is not a dream. This is not a vision. This is not an imagination. This is a real event. The place was in Jerusalem, and it was in the temple when Isaiah, the man of God, the great prophet, went up to the temple. We don't know, was he there during the week, or was he there on a Sabbath? Was he, what what was he doing there? We don't know. He doesn't say, except that he went up to the temple, and he tells us when. He remembers it as in the year that King Uzziah died. Uzziah was one of the kings under which Uh, Isaiah lived, Uzziah decided one day he would usurp or invade the the priest's office. And he went to the temple and he offered up incense. And only the priest was to do that. So Uzziah was smitten with a skin disease of some type. And literally his flesh rotted away. It was a horrible disease because God judged him for intruding into the Uh, into the place of the great high priest in those days. And so in the year that he died, Isaiah remembers, 
That's the time I saw the Lord. If you, you and I ever really see God as Isaiah did, we will not forget the time or the place, will we? And you know, we mark time the same way Isaiah did. We say in the year that such and such occurred, maybe my mother died that year, or in the future we'll say 2020. You see, that was the year that we had COVID-19. And we'll mark time from this event that we're going through right now. And our grandchildren and great-grandchildren will probably speak of what is happening right now. They'll date remembrances to it. Now, Isaiah met God. Notice what he says in verse 1. I saw also the Lord. I saw the Lord. Now, what does he mean by that phrase? Because throughout the Bible, people long to see God. But they were unable to because God is so great. He told Moses, if you look on my face, you would die. You would be so overwhelmed. The human being cannot even survive looking into the face of holy God. And you remember that Moses said, God, I, I'm, just, I, I'm so disappointed and discouraged. I need to see you to know what you're like because I'm leading these people. I've got all these problems. And God said, stand over there by that rock, and I'm going to pass by, but I'm going to be going, coming from behind you and going away from you, and you're going to see my back parts, but you cannot see my face and live. Well, Isaiah has a similar experience. Only he goes up to the temple, and he sees the Lord. Now, he sees a limited view of God because no man can see God. He is infinite. But he sees part of God. In fact, let me tell you what I believe. In your Bible, John chapter 12 and verse number 41 says that Isaiah saw Jesus Christ. Isaiah saw his glory. And so in John 12 and 41, I believe that is telling me that this was Jesus Jesus Christ himself that Isaiah saw that day. And what was the Lord doing? He's sitting on a throne. That refers to his authority. Thrones in the Bible always represent authority. He, and so Jesus is sitting on his throne. This is Jesus not in his human body, though. This is before the incarnation. This is Jesus before he ever came to the earth and was born in Bethlehem's manger. So we don't know exactly what form he was in. We assume he was in the same. Well, we know he was in the same form as his father because the Bible tells us that. And he's sitting on his throne, meaning he's ruling over the universe, that he is the sovereign king and ruler of the entire universe. And because he is not in a human body that had not yet come into being yet as he is now, but because he was not in a human body, he had to be in some sort of a spirit body, spiritual body, or soulish body, some call it. And because he was in a spirit form, it doesn't mean he can't be seen. Because Isaiah specifically said, I saw him. Now, many people have testified to seeing angels throughout history. The Bible talks about people who saw an angel. So this spirit being form, an angel's a spirit, this spirit being form has some kind of shape and form and recognition that we can't totally comprehend. You remember on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah appeared with the Lord Jesus Christ, and Peter, James, and John saw them. Now hold on. Elijah had been in heaven with the Lord. He was taken to heaven, but Moses was in a grave, and yet he was seen. And the disciples looked upon them and recognized them. They not only were seen, they were not only a form, they were a recognizable form. So Jesus here is seated on the throne, but it's before he ever became a human being. So Isaiah looks and sees him. He doesn't tell us anything more about him except that he saw his form. But he describes him. He's high and he's lifted up. 
and his train fills the temple. The train is the trailing part of a robe, like when a bride walks down the aisle and her dress is on the ground and trails behind her, a beautiful train, a part of a, a robe. And this is what he saw in the Lord, high and lifted up, and on a train, or on a throne, and the train fills the entire temple, the, the garments and the resplendent uh, uh, uniform, if you will, that, that the Lord has on, the, the, the clothing that He wears. It represents His transcendence. And by transcendence, that, that's a big word. It means overall, that God is high and lifted up and overall that he is above all else. He transcends the entire universe in his greatness. Isaiah is fascinated by the scene. He can't get over it. He's, but he's also terrified. He is absolutely overwhelmed. He's ne there's nothing to compare in all of his human existence with what he's looking at as he stands there in the temple. He sees the Lord above and before and beyond all that he has ever been able to comprehend, visible and recognizable, and yet mysterious beyond the ability of a human to comprehend. And then in verse 2, above the throne of God stood the seraphims. With two wings, they cover their face out of reverence for God. With two wings, they cover their feet. With two wings, they fly. The only time seraphims are even mentioned in the Bible is right here. You will not find them anywhere else. We don't know much else about them except they have six wings. They're heavenly creatures. That's all we know about them. The word seraphim actually means a burning one, one that is on fire. And in the Bible, fire, as you know, always represents purity. So these are pure, pure creatures who hover around the throne of God and they speak. And what is it that it so impresses Isaiah as he stands here in verse number 3? One of the seraphims cried unto another, and they said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of His glory. What impresses Isaiah is the holiness of God. Now, I've given you a long description because I want you to truly grasp and understand this at as deep a level as possible. But now, I come to the point that I really want you to get today in the message. And it is this, the holiness of God. The song of heaven the song of the seraphim is, God is holy. The seraphim repeats it three times. And in the Hebrew language, that is the absolute superlative. In English, we will make a statement, something is holy. Then we compare it, something else is more holy. And then we put it in what we call the superlative or the highest degree. Something is most holy, holy more holy, most holy. But they didn't do that in Hebrew. They didn't have that kind of construction in their language. So what they did in Hebrew was they would say, this is holy, holy, meaning more holy, holy, third time, most holy, as holy as anything can be. And this is what the seraphims sing around the throne of Almighty God. They sing, He is as holy, he is infinitely holy. Nothing could be more holy than the God that we worship. Let that sink in. I want you to get a hold of that today, my friend. You see, the word holy has the idea of other. One of the words in Hebrew for holy is other, or one of the descriptions of it. That God is other. Now, what do I mean when I say that? Well, for God to be other, it means He is other than anything else that exists. He is of a different nature than man or any of the physical universe that He created. In other words, you can't say God is like 
anything because God is unlike everything. He's other. His nature is absolutely distinct from anything else that exists anywhere in the universe, a physical universe, or even the world of thought, or the world of the Spirit. God is holy. He's other. He's different. And His very essence is holiness. Holiness meaning to be, separ- to be set apart, unlike anything, separated from everything by His his, his difference, His distinctness, He separated. It, it means that He is absolutely morally pure to a degree and on a level that you and I can't comprehend. Moral purity in an infinite degree, we would say. God is perfection. God has infinite cleanliness. God is other. He is holy. Now, that is something that's lost on our generation. This is something that, oh, every preacher, I wish every preacher could preach this and then apply it, because our generation has lost the concept of holiness. In fact, if I were to say about some godly person I would say that's a very holy man. There's a certain part of our society today that I believe would think, well, but that's, he's weird. He's strange. Because our world is so unholy, so impure, so morally defiled that for a person to be holy is to be weird, to not be understood by the culture around them. That's always been true to some degree, but it is really true in our world today. We live in such a morally defiled world that holiness is almost resented or misunderstood. Uh, if, if a person is a, is a holy person, you can expect to be misunderstood. People will think that you're, you're pious, that you're self-righteous or all kinds of names they have to describe it. But the reality is that God demands holiness from His people. Now, I read that in the book of 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 15. 1 Peter 1 and 15. But as He which hath called you is holy, that refers to God, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation or lifestyle, as the God whose name we bear as Christians, as He is holy, so we are to be holy in the like manner. And then it goes further, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. That's from the book of Leviticus. Be ye holy, for I am holy, so says our Creator. God commands and demands holiness from His people. So what impressed Isaiah as he was in the temple and he sees the Lord? It's the holiness of God, number one. Number two, it's the glory of God. The earth is full of His glory, it says there in verse 3. So the seraphims are singing, holy, 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 and then they're saying, and the whole earth is full of God's glory. Now, the term glory is a term that's often used and rarely defined and, for the most part, I'm afraid, uh, badly misunderstood. We just throw it around, and we don't think through what that word glory means, but it's a, it's a, it's a powerful word, but I find it very difficult to describe what is glory. We use it to talk about the flag, old glory. We use it to talk about... Uh, the glory of some athlete who set a, a sports record or something like that. But the word glory, here, here's a good uh, idea or concept of it. The word glory refers to honor, to, to, the, to the dignity of a person that we honor. 
to recognition and admiration. Glory is the praise that someone gains by who they are in their character or by what they have accomplished in their life. Great accomplishment. Now, we apply that to God. The glory of God is the honor, the dignity, the recognition, the admiration, the praise that we give to God because of who He is, His character, and because of what He's done. And what has He done? Well, the glory of God is revealed in creation. He's the Creator. In verse 3, the earth is full of His glory. In the Psalms, it says that the heavens declare the glory of God, and the earth showeth His handiwork. And you just look up in the heavens. You see the sun, at night the stars and the moon. And if you're thinking about it at all, if you just stop and meditate on that, it is overwhelming how great that really is. The other night I looked out my front door, about a month ago, I guess, and there was a light in the sky. It was so bright, I thought maybe somebody has put a drone up over here two or three or four blocks away and a big drone, a bright light on it. But I watched it, and I found out later that it was the planet Venus. And it was there, and it had this bluish-greenish light coming off of it. And, I mean, it lit up, literally, the night sky that evening. It was a clear, crystal clear, beautiful evening. And, it, and I just stood there and looked at it in the truth of that passage, that the heavens declare the glory of God. Just, it just hit me, and it, it, was, it was a moment to remember all the stars twinkling and their greatness and, and to think of how wonderful it is that they have their courses and they're not running into each other. There's no confusion in the heavens that God has ordained their orbits and their routes, if you will. God is revealed in the skies. He's revealed when the sun comes up every morning and you look out your door and say, oh, what a beautiful sunrise. Then at night, what a beautiful sunset when it goes down in the evening. Now, the sunset is not God, and the universe is not God. We're not pantheists. God is distinct and separate from His creation. He's transcendent above it. He is the great holy God of the universe, and He created the universe. Everything is created except Him, and He is other. He is different from it. I used to like, and still do, and have a whole collection of their records, the Sons of the Pioneers, a Western group, and boy, those guys could sing with such beautiful harmony. And they sung a cowboy hymn, they called it. And it talked about the glory of God in creation. It's called the mystery of His way. I thought of it night before last when those thunderstorms were coming through, and I mean, they were, they were some kind of storms. And I thought of these words, when angry storm clouds rise and wild winds sweep the skies, I'm sure that this must be the mystery of His way. Then comes a glory morn, and bright new things are born, flowers and grass and all that's what's in mine. Then comes a glory morn, and bright new things are born. All this that I may see, the mystery of His way. God, mysterious, holy, high, lifted up, infinite. And yet, His fingerprints are all over the creation. Revealed throughout the earth, the mountains and their majesty, the sea and its infinity, the birds and the flowers. Revealed in man in the image of God Himself. Man is a glorious being, unlike any other being that God made. And the glory of God is revealed in man because man carries God's image. Isaiah was impressed with the glory of God. And the glory of God is revealed in the physical creation, and then it's revealed in God's character. We say we give somebody glory because of their greatness of character, because of who they are. 
God is great. God is holy. God is transcendent. God has power. God has wisdom. I read to you again from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah always is writing, sprinkled throughout all of his books, 66 chapters, are all these themes about the greatness of God. Isaiah chapter 40 has so many of them. It's a beautiful, beautiful passage. Isaiah 40 and 5, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. God says, every creature is going to see my glory. Then he talks about the glory. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and who has meted out the heavens with the span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills with a balance. Verse 15, Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket, and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Verse 17, All the nations before him are as nothing. You know, America ought to remember that. Oh, we are a great country. We're the greatest country that ever existed in history. But do you know what? In the eyes of God, we're like a drop in a bucket. God can get along without America, ladies and gentlemen. The cause of Christ is not dependent on America like we think it is so often. All nations before him are as nothing. The all includes us. They are counted to him less than nothing in vanity. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare him to? He sits upon the circle of the earth, verse 22, and the inhabitants thereof are like grasshoppers. Oh, we think we're so important, don't we? You know how God looks at us? Like one of the grasshoppers. Even though we're special and we're made in his image, we're not as important as we think we are. The chief end of man is not to live for himself. It's to bring glory to God. God was not made for us. We are made for God. In 1 Peter, the writer says that the glory of man is as the grass, meaning it fades quickly. But the glory of God is eternal and lasts forever. So Isaiah sees the Lord. He goes up to the temple, and he meets God face to face. And then Isaiah is impressed with the holiness of God and the glory of God. Now, the last thing, real quick in verse 5. The effect upon him. What happens when a man actually meets God, as Isaiah did? Well, the big thing is it changes your whole view of yourself. It changes the way you look at yourself. What does he say here? He says in verse number 5, Woe is me. I am, a, I, dwell in, I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of, Ho- the Lord of hosts. Woe is me, I am undone. The word undone there has the idea of I'm, I'm cut off from myself. I'm coming apart. This is destroying me. This is so great, so grandiose. I've been so wrong in my thinking that now I see God. I see what is really important. And it changes my view of myself. Woe is me. Over in the book of Revelation chapter 1, you know, John saw the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what he did? He fell on his face. Paul says that someday we'll all stand before him and we'll all fall on our knees and we'll bow and confess that Jesus Christ is God. Every single human being will bow before God. Amazing thought. Isaiah was from an upper-class family. He was a wealthy man. He was an influential man. He was highly educated. Isaiah was among the leaders of the entire nation even before he became a prophet, Jewish history tells us. But once he met God, he didn't think so much of his human attainments. 
Basically, here's what he said. God is holy. And when I met him, I realized I am not. God is holy, and I'm not. And I tell you, I can say that. I, if I'm, when I look at God, I understand he is holy, and I'm not in comparison at all. We kind of in America with our self-esteem psychology, we grow up thinking, oh, I am so wonderful. Oh, I'm marvelous. I love me. I'm wild about myself is our theme song. When you meet God, you know your song changes. Woe is me. I am coming apart in the presence of the Holy One of Israel. And he later wrote in chapter 66, he wrote these words, My righteousness are like filthy rags. When you see God, my friend, in His purity and His holiness and His transcendence, you'll be changed. And that's a problem for those of us who grew up in church. We didn't go off into horrible immorality. We didn't become a part of the drug culture. Um, we didn't curse with every other breath and all that. And so we tend to become very self-righteous. I, I never thought much about it, but years ago, I began to study, and I began to think about this thing. And I, my only conclusion was, is Bill Monroe, you're self-righteous. You're self-righteous. And God has convicted me of that about as much as anything I know. He has convicted me that we grow up in a church atmosphere, and we, we, we as hard as we may try, we begin to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. But when we meet God, there's humility. And I, you'll find that you say, you know, I'm not as clean. I'm not as moral. I'm not as dedicated. I'm not as important as I think I am, as my human flesh would lead me to believe. Meeting God will kill self-righteousness. It will kill pride. I promise you that. So the bottom line for Isaiah is he meets God, and here's his conclusion. God is holy, and I'm not. Woe is me in the light of the holiness and the glory of God. But you know what? Thank the Lord. The Lord didn't leave him there because Christianity is not a defeatist thing of woe is me. That's a temporary thing when you see yourself as you truly are in the brilliant, blinding, blazing holiness of Almighty God. But the Lord didn't leave us there because he sent his son to die on the cross. And the Bible talks about that when we believe God, He imputes to us His righteousness. And God doesn't leave us undone. Through His grace at Calvary and through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, He makes us holy. He makes us righteous people. Not of our own works and our own righteousness, but He declares us righteousness because He puts, He imputes he attributes Christ's righteousness to us when we receive Christ. So on that basis, you can say without pride, I'm a righteous person because your righteousness is not of your own doing. It's a righteousness imputed to you by our loving Lord. Well, I hope today that you've been to Calvary. I hope that you have seen yourself as a sinner, unworthy of God's favor, and yet a recipient of His grace. I hope today that you have seen yourself in need of repentance and that you look at Isaiah chapter 6 and you just absolutely turn to the Lord in saving faith today. He died for you on the cross. His blood was shed that you might be saved. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. 
And so turn today. Turn from your sins and turn to the cross and receive God's forgiveness and receive his righteousness that he wants to give you.